Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is Bob Elson. We're set again with our weekly show. And remember, the Cubs at home this weekend playing the New York Mets. The Mets uh, very, very frequently give the Cubs plenty of trouble, more trouble even than the top teams. The White Sox are playing at Minnesota, and uh, Minnesota's played very well. In fact, they've been one of the surprise teams of the year. We're going to talk baseball at our Skokie office, our new office, by the way, in Skokie. The location is 9215 North Skokie, and it's a beautiful office here, with our guest who is visiting out here for an autographing session, and that's pitcher Ken Holtzman, an old friend of ours who's been on the big league trail for quite a few years, played with a number of clubs. So we'll talk baseball with Kenny, and he'll be with us in just about one minute. Ken Holtzman's career started, as has the career of many, a big leaguer in the Little Leagues, right, Kenny? Well, we didn't really have an organized Little League like they have the national and international program. I grew up in St. Louis, and they have like a local program. And I played baseball probably no more than any other sport, though, when I was a kid growing up. And I really didn't start to really pursue it, I guess, more so than other sports until I got to high school and college. How did the St. Louis Cardinals miss out on you? Well, Actually, they didn't really. I had a chance to sign with the Cardinals when I graduated high school, but I decided to go on to college first before I decided to play. And it just so happens that the year I got out was the first year of the free agent draft, which meant that you could only sign with one particular team rather than a lot of teams chasing you, and it turned out to be the Cubs. Well, you've had a very, very interesting career. You had uh, some fine years with the Cubs and pitched a couple of no-hitters with the Cubs. Well, that's true. I think... uh, You know, my career, I look back on it now after 14 years. I'm just starting my 15th, and probably the best years were spent here in Chicago. And I told somebody the other day that my my greatest thrill, and after having been in five World Series and All-Star Games, and I think my greatest thrill was still when I first went out on the field at Wrigley Field the first time 14 years ago. And, And I said my second greatest thrill was when I was reacquired by the Cubs and I went out there again. Well, you're young enough, and you keep yourself in good shape. Uh, you should still have a few good years. The Cubs could really uh, use you this year. Well, I hope so, and I'm sure everybody knows that I've more or less been laid off a few years by sitting in the Yankee bullpen not doing much. And, you know, it's been kind of tough to come back all at once and get any kind of consistency, but I think if Herman keeps me in a pretty reasonable rotation, I think that, you know, in another couple of weeks, I think I should be able to get some degree of consistency. As as you know, baseball fans all around the country wondered about those couple of years with the Yankees, why you didn't pitch. Can you tell us what what was the trouble anyway? I, re- I really couldn't say. I mean, if I if I really knew, I would I would say it. But uh, you know, in light of the reason that they got me, they Mr. Steinbrenner told me that they got me because the Yankees were about to become a contending team and they wanted a pitcher with Major League uh, World Series experience, which is why they went out and got Catfish Hunter also. But as it turns out, they just didn't use me very often, and uh, uh, the Yankees, of course, became the world championship team, and uh, it's been their policy now to go out and buy players, and I guess a few of them became expendable, and uh, I'm just glad it worked out for me where I could get back home and pitch. Yeah. What kind of a fellow was Steinbrenner to talk to, to do business with? Well, he's he's kind of, uh, he gets excited about the game, and uh, I'll say one thing to his credit, he, he goes all out to win, and if if it's his philosophy that it's going it, to, you take, it takes a lot of money to win. Well, he's going to pursue that philosophy, and he's done it. And it's, I guess it's we've now disproven that old fact that you cannot buy a winner because I guess he did it. Well, are you surprised at the strange happenings at New York now with uh, Lemon out again and Billy Martin back again? And well, I think that just reflects the personality of both Steinbrenner and Billy Martin. Uh, it's, I know that people are kind of guess kind of tired of reading the same old thing about these things that go on in New York, but. Really, the teams that I played on at Oakland with Mr. Finley, probably many more things went on out there than ever went on with the Yankees. It's just that because of the New York media coverage, you probably tend to, they, they over-exaggerate it, and you probably read it more. Well, you had some fine years with Oakland. One year you won 21 and lost 13. Well, I think that uh, now that I look back on it, and even looking at the current Yankee team or the Cincinnati Reds or whatever, I think the uh, Oakland A's team from 72 to 75 was probably the best team in the game, probably in the last 25 years, except maybe the early 50 Yankee teams who did win five in a row. No team has ever won three in a row, just like the A's did in 72, 3, and 4. 
uh, it was just a great blend, good chemistry of winning teams. And uh, I was fortunate that um, all six years that I was in the American League, I was on a pennant winner. You know, it's strange when you look back, and I look back on that Oakland situation, uh, the wonderful team they had. The You've got to give Finley credit. Uh, he put together that team by himself, and I give him credit for that. Well, I'll be honest with you. I didn't get along personally with Mr. Finley, but I'll say to his credit, he was, I thought he was excellent at putting together, and like I say, probably the best team in the last 25 years, and he would go all out to win, and if I was... If we needed a player in August or September to put us over the hump, he would go out and get it. And uh, I think all the players to this day that are now probably on different teams now that as a result of being broken up, I think if they had it to do all over again, I think we all wish that we had that team still intact. That was a marvelous team. Yeah, it sure was, and I think that we could have continued winning for five or ten more years. You notice uh, your old buddy Campanaris is still at it. Campy, I noticed, went to the Angels, and I'm sure he'll make a difference down the stretch. And Tennis and Fingers are with San Diego, and Bandos with Milwaukee, and Hunter and Jackson are with New York. And uh, it, I don't know, it was just a great team when you stop and think about it. Uh, Kenny, what about a lot of people around the league and around the National League, and as well as the American League, feel that uh, Earl Weaver could be rightfully called the best manager in baseball. Without question, I think he's the finest manager and, and tactician there is in the big leagues. Uh, a lot of players, from when I talked to, and I wasn't over there that long. I was over there for about three months, about half the year. And uh, I understand from talking to a lot of players that have been in the Baltimore organization that Earl sometimes a little bit tough to deal with, especially off the field. But I'll say this. When it comes to just the baseball game itself, there's nobody better at manipulating players, uh, just adjusting to the whole situation of the game than Earl Weaver. I think he's the finest by far that I've ever seen. Well, that's interesting. I felt the same way about him. I, Having broadcast some 40 years in the big leagues, I saw plenty of Weaver. And one of the uh, great things about Weaver, he might wind up in an extra inning game, but he's always got somebody left. I mean, he, he can outthink or outmanage or outprepare for a situation. Well, I think his record speaks for itself. I, I, it just seems like every year he gets the most amount of play, I mean, the most out of his players. And really, when you look at the Baltimore Orioles in the last couple of years, they really haven't had probably the personnel of maybe a Boston or a New York, but they've certainly been right up there. And I think he's the main reason. Well, I agree with you. What about the Bobby Mercer business? Well,. First of all, it wasn't a surprise. Everybody knew that Bobby was either about to be traded or was the subject of trade talks from day one of spring training this year, so it really was no shock. I think the shock to every all the Cub players, at least the, the reading I get, was that I think that we probably should have got more in return that could help us right away. I mean, I'm not saying that the pitcher that we got and is at Wichita will not turn out to be a good major league pitcher. That certainly, I hope so. But immediately i think it's kind of it's kind of hard for the players to realize how a sum of money and uh maybe the forfeiture of bobby's contract to another team that we don't have to assume anymore mm -hmm. is going to help the cubs themselves win and that's all we were thinking about we weren't thinking about necessarily you know the the problems of the front office or anything like that we we our job is to win and that's how we get paid and we're professionals and we have to think about that first because that's what management expects of us is to go out and win and we couldn't put it in the proper perspective i just hope it turns out in the long run that they did the right thing yes yeah. You've seen him more than I have, and uh, we get such good reports on him. How good is young Thompson? Well, Scotty obviously is a very aggressive ball player, and f my personal opinion is that the amount of offense that we're going to get out of Thompson and Vale, platooning him, will probably be more than what Bobby could have done playing every day. I, I think that those two are young and aggressive, and they'll probably help us more defensively. You know, they're just younger, they're quicker, but... Mercer was the kind of guy I guess you just like to have on the club. Uh, I, you know, even if you didn't play him and he was sitting on the bench and it got down to a crucial situation in the last part of the game, I think I'd want Bobby up there, you know, a few times. So, but I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm a friend of Bobby's and I, I'm glad it worked out for him too. I, I think he was having a tough time early on in the season, you know, with the reception that he got in Chicago, and now he's going home to New York where he started. And um, it's kind of like my situation coming back here. It's it's just nice to be home. Yeah. Well, I think that's true, and I think that's uh, really a good way to look at it. What about Reggie Jackson? How did you and he hit it off? Reggie and I are, are very good and close friends. We have been since I got traded over the A's in 72. Uh, I've always found Reggie to be a, very honest and, and, and very friendly with me. He's always a very charitable guy. He's uh, 
Re- Reggie, I think, is uh, judged by the amount and by the quality of newspaper clippings written about Reggie. And uh, I think if a lot more people would take a little bit more time to, to talk to Reggie on a, on a personal, down-to-earth yeah. level, I think they would find they would be uh, pleasantly surprised uh, of the kind of individual Reggie really is. I've, I agree with you. I got along with him fine, and I found him a very interesting guy to be with. Right. Well, Reggie was having, when he first came over to the Yankees, the only two persons he would talk with were Catfish and myself, because we played with him in Oakland and we knew him, and he had a tough time getting adjusted. But eventually, Reggie's magnetism, I guess, starts to come out, and he began to make friends, and even though he had a tough time with maybe some of the players who maybe resented uh, his status, I guess. Uh, nevertheless, Reggie was an important part of why the Yankees won. Uh, it's true that the Yankees had not won a world championship since seven, since 1964, and Reggie came over there and certainly helped them win that playoffs and World Series. You know, the Cubs really is a turning is turning out. Made a remarkable deal with Philadelphia. Oh, I think that's uh, the highlight trade in the major leagues. Uh, Sizemore has been absolutely great. Sec. Um, Jerry Martin, of what can you say? He's you know he's almost the player of the month. Tremendous, right? And he's just uh, this is his best offensive year by far. And Barry Foote, while you may not be probably impressed by his batting statistics, he is the most important part of the trade because he's stabilized the whole pitching staff, and all the pitchers love to pitch to Barry. He just take he can takes control of the game. He makes the young pitchers aggressive, and he even helps me. And I'm the old guy. Well, that's an interesting slant because everybody's talking about Martin. Martin G. will probably be the Great center fielder for the Cubs and about, well, Sizemore has surprised a lot of people. I tell you, I don't know uh, that Trio can do so much more than Sizemore well, can. And, I, I would imagine that if you look at their statistics, you would say that Manny's probably more talented. But I'll say one thing. Uh, Teddy is like Buckner. He's a gamer, yeah. and he shows up to play every day, and he'll get his uniform dirty, and he's diving, and he's doing this. And yeah. it may not show up in the stats where he's having a great year, but he's, uh, but he, he's a gamer, and I like him behind me. I, I really love to watch him play. Our guest today, and we're delighted to have him out at our new Skokie office, by the way, and if you live out this way, be sure to stop in and get acquainted with the nice people that run this office at 9215 North Skokie Avenue. Our guest is Ken Holtzman, and we'll be back with our guest in just a moment. We're delighted to have Ken Holtzman uh, at our new Skokie office, and I personally am delighted because I've always admired this fellow, and I've always enjoyed it. I happen to broadcast some of the really great games that he's pitched, and I've enjoyed him, uh, his work professionally very, very much. You know, the, the Yankees this year, you would seem, with the addition of uh, the young man from Los Angeles, uh, would seem to have the three best pitchers on one team in, in the major league. Tommy John, Goudry, and Figaro. Well, that's certainly true, except that uh, Tommy John is getting up there in age. Um, Figaro has always had a history of arm trouble, and Ron Guidry is certainly the best pitcher in the majors right now, except that I happen to know that Ronnie has kind of a tender arm also, and he can't be used every fourth day for the whole year. He needs a, a couple of days off, which means that those positions must be filled in occasionally with other guys. Catfish Hunters had physical problems, and Don Gullitz had physical problems, and they got Louis T. on. Louis is over 40 years old, and it's tough for a guy like that. Yeah. To, so the Yankees definitely have uh, an, an unstable pitching staff, while they do have big names and who have had big years. But nevertheless, they're going to have to be consistent probably after the All-Star break in order to catch a team like Baltimore, who has great pitching and a great handler of pitchers in Earl Weaver. <laughs> they surely have. Well, how do you account for the remarkable year as a, as a fine pitcher yourself that Gudry had? Uh, that was really remarkable. What was it, 25 and 3 or 4? Ronnie went 25 and 3, and he had a fantastic number of strikeouts. And uh, Ronnie's a power pitcher, and he's developed a, a, just a hard breaking slider, which is not too much slower than his fastball, so the hitter can't be geared you know, for a straight pitch all the time. You know, Ronnie labored in the Yankee minor leagues for about seven or eight years. It's not like he came on the scene overnight from some school. Or Ronnie worked hard, and uh, from what I understand, that he never really got that much of a chance in the Yankee minor league and in the major league training camp. Well, finally, with all the injuries, the Yankees had to press some of their minor league players into service, and it gave Ronnie a chance really to refine his, the skill that he always had. And as it turns out, he's, he's now the best pitcher in the major leagues. 
Just um, uh, absolutely amazing. Uh, I was amazed that the Dodgers, uh, with all the money they make and uh, drawing three hundred thousand people or three million people a year, could let Tommy John go. And uh, it looks like they're out of it. Well, it's, Bob, there's no question about that. They're having trouble, and and obviously a big thing is they're missing Tommy John. They just don't have a left-handed stopper that you know yeah. can uh, just put a stop to a Dodger uh, losing streak like they're going to uh, every couple of weeks now. But uh, like you say, I, I can't understand that the Dodgers are certainly one of the most well-endowed teams when it comes to attendance and fan support. And I'm certainly they have they must draw upon great revenues where they can keep their main players. But yet they chose not to. And I, you're not going to elicit too much sympathy from some of the players when you talk about no, that situation. No, it's, it's really strange. You wonder why they would do a thing like that. Well, that's true, and especially a guy that helped him get to two World Series, Tommy John, who's pitched so great for him. And it's just a shame that Tommy couldn't stay there. You know, I was really surprised at that deal. Well, I was surprised uh, when he left Chicago the first time. Well, that's yeah. true. I, I guess he left in the Richie Allen trade uh, when he was yeah. traded first. And uh, Tommy's always been a good professional type pitcher. He's all, you know how he pitches. He keeps the ball down. He doesn't walk hardly anybody. He doesn't strike out that many. But yet, you know, he's he's just a good pitcher, and he'll battle you. He's a good competitor. And that's the way he is with the Yankees, too. What is the uh, what is the secret of uh, Suter's uh, remarkable ability to throw that remarkable sinker, I guess you call it. Somebody told me, a pretty good ball player and a guy that you know as well as I do, Ted Williams, that these guys are standing too far back on him. They should step on him, step up a foot just as he delivers that ball before it, before it breaks. Now, you know, he's one of the smartest guys. I don't have to tell you. Well, I've, there's no question about yeah. that. I know about Ted's theories on hitting. Everybody says that he's the master at it, except that a, a you know, a hitting coach can't sight the ball for anybody. You can teach a guy all the right mechanics and, and all the grip and everything else in the stride, but you cannot see the ball for the guy. And if a ball's coming up there at about 85 miles an hour and it's sinking out of the strike zone at the last possible second when you have to swing, no amount of hitting instruction is going to help you hit that pitch. It, you're going to have to see it and use your own hand-eye coordination to hit that baseball, and it's not as easy as Ted says. Well, I, I am inclined to agree with you, but he gave me quite a... He was in town last week, and I had breakfast with him. He's an old friend of mine. And we got to be talking about that, and but he was talking about some other pitcher in the league who's got a, a great sinker, and he says, these guys should... Step up on it. Well, don't, I'm, I'm don't sh- let that ball dip before you. Start. Well, there's not many hitters like Ted Williams around either, and I'm sure Ted could probably hit any kind of a pitch, and that's why he was he was uh, probably the greatest hitter there ever was. But it's pretty hard to impart that knowledge to somebody else when when that guy's got to be the one looking at this pitch and actually making the decision to when to swing that bat. It's a little bit different. Yeah. What about one of your former teammates with the Yankees, N- Nettles, who's dangerous? Oh, he's uh, one of the finest home, pure home run hitters they have in that league. Uh, he reminds me a lot of a left-handed Killebrew in that uh, he's liable to hit a home run at any time. And if you were to look at his batting average over the years, he's probably in the 240s or 250s at the most. But yet he's always dangerous. He always is a good clutch hitter. And uh, plus he's probably the best defensive third baseman in the whole league. So he's really a very valuable man to the Yankees. You just brought up a very, very interesting point because I saw Brooks Robinson all during his career, and I tell you, this guy isn't far behind him. He's he's probably the best in the majors right now. Well, I think that he ranks with anybody as far as best in the majors. Uh, a lot of people like Mike Schmidt at third base with the Phillies the defense, but I haven't seen anybody necessarily to be as good as, as Greg is. No, he's, uh, he's, he's really remarkable. What do you recall about those no-hit games you pitched? <laughs> Well, I can remember the first one uh, was in 1969, and uh, we had just come off a West Coast trip, and the Cubs had a big lead, of course, that year for a long time. And I remember there was 43,000 people or 42,000 in Wrigley Field that day, and all the players were just emotionally high to begin with. And uh, it just seemed that that game was the culmination of the whole year. As it turns out, immediately after that game for a few weeks, the Cubs did start to go downhill, and we lost a big chunk of our lead in the next two weeks. Uh-huh. Well... Gee, there must be a, a lot of satisfaction in going through nine innings and uh, not allowing a hit. Well, there's a lot of luck involved. Now, I can remember the second no-hit game I pitched in Cincinnati. It was the last of the eighth inning, and Bench was the hitter, and this was at Cincinnati. And Sano, of course, is playing back with two outs. Johnny hits the ball so hard, and Bench dropped a bunt down the third base line. The ball just went foul right at the bag. Now, it would have been an easy base hit, of course, because nobody expected Johnny. It was a one nothing game, and nobody expected Bench to bunt in a one nothing game. And... If, if that ball wouldn't have rolled foul by two feet right at the bag, then he'd have got the first hit. What did you try to do with Rose? 
basically keep the ball down, move it around. Uh, Pete's, I think, equally uh, good from both sides of the plate, left or right, so I only see him from the right side. It just looks to me like you got to keep the ball down, and he's going to get his hits off anybody, Bob. I think the time is you got to try to make a good pitch on Pete when he can really hurt you. If there's a man on second or third or something like that late in the ball game, you got to try to pitch around Pete a little bit because... Uh, he he just always was a good clutch hitter. He's going to get his hits off everybody. It doesn't matter who the pitcher is, and you just got to try to minimize the damage that he does. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. What about Foster? Oh well, he's he's the National League's Jim Rice. Uh, he's just a a damaging. Like Reggie Jackson says, he does a lot of damage with his bat. Uh, he's he's just a great hitter. He hits with power all over, and you got to move the ball around. That's all you can say. You can't throw the same pitch twice, Foster. He'll murder it. <laughs> Our guest at our new Skokie office, a beautiful new office out here on Skokie Avenue, is Ken Holtzman of the Cubs. And he'll be pitching, by the way, in one of the doubleheader games on Sunday. The Cubs are home. That's tomorrow, by the way. We'll be back with a sign-off with our guest in just one minute. You know, Kenny, we have a minute or so, but we've been talking about managers before. Another fellow we both know He's got that Montreal club looking like pennant winners, and that's Dick Williams. Well, there's a guy probably, and I understand that the Montreal team has a lot of kind of diverse personalities on their team. And, of course, Dick was with the greatest group when he was with us at Oakland, I guess. So if anybody can handle it, uh, Dick could, and he'll probably get the most out of the, the Expos. It comes back to pitching. If Lee and Grimsley and those kind of guys can hold up for a whole year, they're going to be right in it at the end. One of the things maybe you haven't noticed or haven't somebody hasn't said in front of you, they have a remarkable ability, those outfielders on that team, to throw. they probably the best throwing outfield in the majors. Oh, if you mean Cromartie, Dawson, and yeah. Valentine, oh, absolutely. And, and they changed the whole game because uh, on an AstroTurf field, you figure a base hit, the runner is going to try to go from first to third because the ball's always r- rolling pretty fast. And if those guys throw the ball out, it changes the whole inning. In fact, it happened to us four times in the first Montreal series where a guy got thrown out either from second to the plate or first to third. One of those three guys threw somebody out. <laughs> well, I wish you lots of luck uh, in the uh, doubleheader tomorrow, and I uh, hope you'll wind up with a fine season with the Cubs. I think that, uh, as I said before, you love the game, you kept yourself in shape, and I think you still have a lot of ability left, and I hope you come up with a real good one. We've enjoyed having you out here at our new office in Skokie. Well, thank you, Bob. It's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you, Ken. Ken Holtzman of the Cubs, our guest. Next week, we're going to talk with Jim Enright, who, by the way, is now in the Basketball Hall of Fame. And as you know, he works at Wrigley Field and does a fine job up in the press box. And he and uh, Ray Meyer both got into the Basketball Hall of Fame at about the same time. So he'll be our guest next Saturday at this same time. Remember, the new time is 5.30 to 6 on this fine station, WAIT. Bob Elson saying thanks for being with with us, and we'll see you next Saturday at the same time.